Yes, we are fired up. <laughs> another, <laughs> another week here. Another week. In this, we're here, here with Matt. Uh, we are finishing up Genesis. This is the last chapter of Genesis. Few things today. This is a big. This is a big day for our daughter Caroline. I'll be taking her later on today to Newark International Airport, where she'll be flying. Uh, first, this layover stop in Portugal, and then Portugal to London, and uh, she's going to be uh, have to quarantine there for two weeks in England, and then she'll be uh, doing her classes. Well, she'll be doing her classes online before then, but. But then uh, she'll be starting her schooling in London, at a school in London. So pray for God's blessings to be upon her. Also, uh, this weekend, we're going to continue with our outdoor worship services. Uh, you can see details at goodshepherdsc.org. Also, prayer requests, pastorbeatsbang at comcast.net. And I just wanted to let you know that um, for our outdoor worship, uh, it's at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. if you're in the State College area. And you're welcome to, uh, I've started kind of telling people that we have a tent set up outside. We're going to put some heaters outside, be a little bit warmer. Uh, but also, you can drive your car right down onto the grass. So if uh, you're not comfortable walking across an uneven uh, lawn space, please feel free to drive your car down on the grass. And um, you can... You can even stay in your car if you want and just put the window down a bit. You'll be able to hear. We have speakers. So, you're welcome to join us for worship, 9 and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday. Also, if you're in the State College area and you like mountain biking, we're going to do mountain biking after church on Sunday. We'll leave from the church parking lot at 12.15 in the afternoon. So, mountain biking this Sunday as well. Uh, it should be beautiful. Uh, leaves are turning. Out in the, get out in the woods a little bit. We'll see what see what's happening with as far as that goes. All right, so we're gonna finish up uh, Genesis. Then next week, well, I can't leave it hanging like this. We're gonna have to go into Exodus. So we're gonna go right to, to Exodus, and then after that, we'll we'll probably go to a New Testament uh, book. Uh, after that, if if people still want to watch and and be a part of this, so thank you for joining us. Again, uh, Genesis chapter 50. Uh, also, that today, of course, we, I'm sure most of you have heard the news that uh, the president and the first lady tested positive for COVID. We want to keep them in our prayers. And uh, no matter what you think, of, uh, you know, we're, we're called to pray for our leaders as Christians. We're called to pray for them. So you no know, whether if you're a big supporter of them or not a supporter of them, we're called to pray for, as Christians, to pray for our leaders. So... Uh, and for all people who are really suffering from this virus, uh, the COVID virus. So we will have that in our prayers today. All right, let's uh, take a look. We're diving in. Are you able to turn the pages with those gloves? You <laughs> need the... the uh, I'll get it. <laughs> what is it, nitrile? No, nit nit nitrile. The, the type of gloves that have like the... Oh, really? You can actually work your cell phone and every, other things <laughs> uh, with... There, there is a certain kind of glove that you can get. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we're in Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to start us off today. So his father Jacob has died. Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father, his father Israel, which is Jacob. Um, so the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him my father made me swear an oath and said, I'm about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father. Then I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he had made you swear to do. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court, and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with them. It was a very large company. When they reached the threshing floor of Ated near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly, and there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. When the Canaanites who lived there 
saw the morning at the threshing floor of Atad. Uh, they said the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That is why the place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizram. And so Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. They buried him, they carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, where Abram, which Abram had brought, bought as a burial place from Ephraim the Hittite, along with the field. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants, servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You, attended, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Makar, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Okay. All right, so let's have a prayer. Father, uh, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we pray, Lord God, we, you would teach us now and our hearts would be open to you, to your leading and guiding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we, uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of sad in one sense. The, um, the, the very last sentence um, in there was in the book of Genesis. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And um, this is the legacy of our rebellion against God, that death has entered into, uh, into the creation, uh, and we brought it on by our rebellion against God. Now, death, in the, in the sense uh, where God did not let us reach out and take hold of the tree of life, is actually uh, a blessing of his grace because he's saying, I'm not going to have you live in this state for eternity, uh, in this state of brokenness and sinfulness, that it's gonna cost me to bring you back to me. It's gonna cost the death of my only son. But in, that, in and through the death of my only son, as you place your faith and trust in him, that when you breathe this last on your on this earth you will be united with god in heaven where this brokenness and sinfulness will not will be no more uh he will wipe away every tear from every eye so that that is ultimately the price that god is going to pay so that death loses its sting uh for us so in the midst of that of everything that's going on in the world around us it's a good thing to remember as was uh as we're ending up this book but I uh, I want you to kind of uh, also see that uh, Joseph is faithful to um, his father's calling to have him buried and just by what's going on here with the uh, the number of officials and everything else that are that are going up with him and how they're able to traverse the territory the land it seems to me that Egypt's in a very powerful position at this time. That's just kind of reading in, in there because they're not concerned about, oh, they're having this large company of officials and dignitaries going up to Canaan, and they're not really concerned about being attacked, it seems like. They're just like, oh, we're able to go. And um, 
you know, they have chariots with them and other things. I'm sure they had some armed guards, but there's no other big power mm-hmm. uh, that seems like it's going to oppose them. So that's one thing you can kind of look and see in the uh, uh, the march of history, you know, when Egypt may have been at more of its zenith of power at this time. And at one time it was a world power, Egypt. So uh, they're able to go up there, no problem. And he's able to fulfill his father's wish to take him up to the cave that was bought from Ephraim the Hittite and be buried next to Abram uh, and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and, uh, and the whole works. So uh, here's a beautiful thing though. Um, his brothers after, uh, after their dad dies, the brothers are like, uh oh, now we're toast. Dad's gone. Now he's gonna enact revenge. He's gonna, he's gonna let the hammer fall. If you look at verses 15, and uh, following him, you know, this is what you're to say to Joseph. So th- they lie about their father's instructions. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers and sins and the wrongs they have committed in treating you so badly. So that's another that's another lie. But here's jo- here's Joseph's reaction. After his brothers come in verse 18 and throw themselves down before him, we are your slaves, they said. Uh, So they're still processing the guilt. They're still processing the guilt of what they had done. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What an awesome view of life that when things happen in our lives that uh, we can say, am I in the place of God? It is God's place ultimate for ultimately to, to judge. Jesus has said, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And so that uh, the world would be so much a better place if people weren't at each other's throats constantly. If, if we're, we're in a, living in a time and an era when there's just um, the level of decency is it just kind of plummeted down to a, a low level and everybody's at a, you know, each other's opposition, each other's throats. We can't sit down and have a conversation on anything. It seems like if, if you disagree, you're automatically a, uh, an enemy of the other person. Like you can't have, uh, a, a disagreement. Um, and to me, Tolerance has been redefined to mean that you have to be in agreement with someone, and that's that's tolerance, like to be in agreement. Now, t- true tolerance is we can disagree on an issue, we can disagree on something, and still be friends, and still talk, and still have a conversation on these things. That's true tolerance. Other the other is not tolerance. They say you have to adhere to what I say or you're a hater or you hate me or you listen to that and other, other thing. So this this is very important. And I think Joseph is setting an example here of not holding a grudge. He's not holding out for that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. So what, what, is, what are some things you, you see from this? <laughs> I mean, certainly that last point there is valid. Um, as far as what's going on, like, you know, and mm-hmm. how we can interact and... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So forth. I'm reading a book right now. It's called Uncommon Ground by Tim Keller, and it's all about how to live as a Christian in a world of difference. So it's a little unrelated, but to what you're talking about, uh, certainly during this election season, I just I was like, I better pick this book up because <laughs> uh, it's a lot of division, right? So how right. Can we... It's so device. It's so divisive. It's like either either you're this, or you know, uh, I just saw some some guy got thrown off of a cycling team for uh, being a Trumper, a Trump supporter, right? And then of one of the cycling teams. And then, you know, it's just, the reactions are so, uh, so few. And I see, you know, you just drive up our street here and it's almost like point counterpoint, right? Somebody puts up a Trump sign and then somebody else puts up a Biden sign right across the street. And I noticed one on the next block up, it's, it's like they put some Biden signs up and then the other guy across the street, puts his Trump sign up about, you know, support Trump and family and country. And and it's like the way they're facing, it's almost like 
they're yelling at each other with signs <laughs> in, in essence mm -hmm. <laughs> in there so you you see that you see that very vividly i've never seen so many political signs in our neighborhood as i have this election cycle there's a lot there is a 50%. lot 50% yeah i mean it's just it's just amazing i mean i just I, i'm just amazed at how many people are at so people are like fired up and it's very dev very divisive so uh keep in mind uh, as as followers of jesus uh that we're called to be salt and light in the world that we can disagree with people on issues without uh hating them without saying okay that's it i'm done with you uh, i don't want to talk to you anymore so let's let's forge a different way a different example to the people around us so let's have a time of prayer and um we want to lift uh, the president up and all those who are affected by this virus. Father God, we come to your presence giving you praise and thanks this day for the life you've given to us in and through Jesus. Uh, I want to pray for Caroline first. Of all, Lord God, as she goes into this new phase of her life, I pray for your blessing to be upon her, for safe travel for her as she heads over to England. Keep her in your care. May she have a fantastic time of studying there. Uh, and may you bless her time there, Lord God. I just lift her before you. So thankful for her and the door that you have opened for her. Pray for uh, uh, Melania and President Trump and for Hope Hicks and for all those who have been affected by this uh, virus. I uh, pray that this, the symptoms are not severe for them and that they are able to go through this uh, quickly and come out uh, healthy on the other side. We pray for all those who have been struggling with uh, with this virus. And I pray, Lord God, for the students of Penn State. There's many who are, um, I think over 2,000 that have um, tested positive. Thankfully, I haven't heard of severe cases. And I pray, Lord God, that for healing for each and every student that has contracted the virus. And we pray, Lord God, that um, we as a nation would find a way to move forward in a way that is honoring to you, that we would humble ourselves before you. We need you desperately. Lord, we cry out to you. We confess our sin before you, and we repent of it, and we turn to you, Lord God. We, we know Jesus is the only hope. He's the only hope for us. So we cry out to you, Jesus. Extend your healing touch upon us and upon our nation. We pray in your mighty name, dear Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.